let me introduce um, our panelists. And um, one by one, I'm going to ask you to come up here. Um, this is, as I said earlier, kind of the Berlinale moment. So you can give all of them, each of them, um, their deserved applause. So welcome to the stage, Dr. Andreas Audrich, member of the German Bundestag, Bündnis 90 Die Grünen. It is, uh, it is free seating. I'm going to take um, uh, the seat out here. Then I take it on this side. <laughs> so, next I welcome Tony Fernandez, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, U.S. Department of State. <clears throat> Tony, I think you deserve an extra applause, right? It's your first time in Berlin? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, I also welcome Emmanuel Fresser, EU Affairs Manager, UPS Europe. Uh, Then, I welcome a good old friend. Um, I, they are all friends. Um, and they're not old, they're just long-term friends. Um, welcome Stefan Ruhnhoff, member of the German Bundestag, CDU. And last but not least, um, Miss Raw Materials um, <laughs> Recycling, um, a wonderful um, friend um, of the Espen Institute, Marie-Christine von Hahn, Vice President, Corporate External Affairs, Aurubis. <laughs> ah, no, 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 no. So, sorry about this. We can't do this. Um, the two girls sitting on the stage right next to each other. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, can I ask you well, to come course. over here? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> right in the middle where she belongs at the center. So this last panel, and I have to say I always wanted to do this, introducing every one of them and then having this applause kind of moment. Um, so in this, on this last panel, we want to take a closer look um, at supply chains um, and uh, global infrastructure. Um, and we want to look at it more closely, also from a sustainability um, point of view, but also from a security point of view. And um, so I would like to start um, with a very quick round, and um, uh, please, really, really just a very fast round. Um, what does sustainable supply chains mean to you? in very few words. And let's start with Marie-Christine. To me, um, sustainable supply chains means that we find a way with international partners um, and design the supply chains in a way where everybody along that supply chain makes what he or she or the country can do best. Thank you so much. Um, Andreas, what is sustainability? Maybe I start um, from that angle. I think sustainable supply chains first uh, is stop being naive. We have been very naive in the past years when it comes to having supply of uh, gas from Russia, for example, but also in the corona crisis. We always thought that material is just here. Nobody cared about it, actually. So stop being naive from a security point of view, but stop being naive when we look at the crisis that we have in front of us, the climate crisis as well, so being sustainable in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Tony. Yeah, I would say uh, I'll start with four words. Mm -hmm. Good, uh, achievable, uh, 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 partnerships, which you, you mentioned, and then the fourth is that uh, it's critically important. Okay, and there we have our first tweet uh, for this uh, panel. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Um, so, Stefan, yeah. sustainable supply chains. Sustainable supply chains do have to address uh, certain policy fields, I think. And uh, one field which was just mentioned is the security issue. It has to address social issues. It has to address uh, environmental issues. And I think if we have, uh, if we can fulfill certain criteria in all these uh, areas, we actually have sustainable supply chains and that we have to focus on. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Manuel. Well, I would say that sustainable supply chain also inter entails uh, facilitating trade of environmental goods. Mm -hmm. uh, trade facilitation, it was reminded yesterday by the Deputy Director General of the WTO, facilitating trade for clean goods, efficiency, efficiency energy products, I think is extremely important. And removing also tariff and non-tariffs barriers for those type of goods mm -hmm. can help us also in lower emissions. So I think that's also another important point to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is a good basis to uh, continue our discussion. Um, now, a second fast round. Why is it so difficult to establish sustainable supply chains? And um, let me ask uh, Tony, why is it so hard, or is it not hard at all? Uh, I mean, I, I say it is hard, uh, but I think it's hard because it's something that uh, historically we haven't focused on. Uh, and I think that you know the, the, the pandemic has given us a chance to really think about how our supply chains are, are structured. Uh, I, I'm with the, the you know obviously the U.S. government and uh, the private uh, private sector controls supply chains uh, typically. And so without the pandemic, I don't think the U.S. government would have been as involved in discussing how supply chains uh, should move forward. Uh, go, you know, and, and so uh, now we have a, I think a historic opportunity to examine how how to do that. Mm -hmm. Marie Christine. Well, I'll, I'll add on, uh, add to what Tony just said. Um, I think when we look at our supply chain, so Arubis, for those who don't know it, um, is one of the um, world's leading um, copper producers and the world's leading recycler of copper. Um, so we're completely dependent on uh, on, the in, on international um, suppliers and on uh, function, well-functioning uh, supply chains. So, um, and what we face in, uh, in sourcing both primary sources from mines and secondary uh, sources from, uh, from, from recycling dealers, uh, from scrap dealers, um, is um, that we see still always a certain skepticism about total um, commitment to partnership along those supply chains. This is what I was referring to in the beginning also. So um, if you take, for instance, Chile as one of the most, um, most important copper suppliers, um, they have a very strong tendency to, I don't know, at least to, uh, under their current new government, um, to go for as much independence and as much um, sovereignty and and management of their own raw materials um, along a vast part of the supply chain. Whereas we would say, let's see how we can design the supply chain. You um, focus and uh, on, on sustainable mining because we're all dependent on it and we'll help you with um, going forward with, with sustainable further development of products. So I think um, these partnership um, thoughts um, of who does what best in, in the most um, CO2 friendly and the most uh, climate friendly and the most uh, uh, the, yeah CO2 em less CO2 emitting um, way in the yeah, in the most sustainable way of producing. Let's have a look at that. And this um, coming back to your question, what is the difficulty? So really committing um, oneself to not bi um, bilateral um, partnerships between one company and the other, but really have a look at the entire supply chain and see um, how can we interact for the global climate which it is uh, to benefit most from, um, and also to see in terms of security, stability, stability and peace, um, ensuring um, wealth mm -hmm. and growth in all countries along those uh, supply chains. That is something we can only jointly work on. But um, I think there's still, um, with these tendencies of nationalism and, 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 uh, and, and a desire for autonomy, as much as autonomy as possible, it will remain a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, Andreas, um, your party has been pivotal in passing um, the Lieferkettengesetz, um, supply chain law. Um, <laughs> supply chain due diligence law. Due diligence law. Thank you very much. Um, and this is this is one of the attempts to make um, supply chains more sustainable. Um, and um, what motivated you, first of all, but secondly also. Um, how, I mean, it was met with a lot of criticism mm -hmm. um, because the implementation isn't that simple. Um, and it creates challenges, particularly for smaller and medium-sized um, enterprises. So what do you tell them? For this question, you asked the question, why is it so difficult? Mm -hmm. And um, I would answer this question by saying that looking in a short-term way of thinking, it is always easier not to adhere to social standards, not to adhere to environmental standards, for example, but also 
to have just-in-time production because you have the feeling then the materials are here and then you can start immediately producing. It's cheaper, it's easier. That's the thought that uh, has uh, over many, many years been the main thought talking about supply chains. And um, the first debates that started on the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act were uh, in a situation when we were only talking about social standards and environmental human rights standards. Now we know that looking into uh, the supply chains means to have more security in general. So having a long-term view brings more human rights, brings more social standards, more environmental standards, but also brings more competitiveness in the long run. And changing this way of looking at economy, at looking at supply chains is crucial in being successful in the end and talking um, to, to, to companies. We have a, an interesting development. Um, there is a long discussion between companies and companies that were at, uh, against such a law 10 years ago, five years ago, are in favor of it now because they know that if we bring the standard up, if we have a level playing field for all the companies, then it's easier for every company that started this already. If you started this, if you know that it is better in the long term, but other companies are not doing it now, then you're not as competitive as they are. But if everybody starts thinking in a long period, then the competitiveness of all the companies gets better in the end. And that's the way of thinking that we need. And talking about this in that way with companies brings them to the point where they actually are in favor of such a law. Oh, really interesting. Turning to um, Stefan, um, this is, I mean, first, first a German law, right? Yes. Um, it's not a European law. It is or EU law. And it's also not a transatlantic initiative so far. And also not a G7 initiative yet. Um, does it make sense um, to go, kind of go it alone? Um, or what would you say? Yeah, so first of all, I would like to, to uh, take some more point. There are a lot of companies in Germany which are not in favor for the supply chain due diligence it's process, yes, that's true. law, and especially the small companies are not uh, in favor of. So secondly, the, the coalition of social democrats and Christian democrats, which I'm a member of, have um, have uh, negotiated on that, and was it was a huge discussion if we need such a law in Germany or if we do not need such a law. And there was also a lot of pressure from the Social Democratic Party to actually bring it bring this law through. From um, my point of view, we have to do something to actually address human rights issues to address environmental issues. The question if, if, is if that law and national law is the right way. We have uh, our argumentation from the Christian Democrats was let's wait for the European law. Um, let's wait what will come up. Now we have, we will actually, the companies have to implement the national law. Um, companies of the size of 3,000 um, uh, workers have to, to implement it from the beginning of this year. So, and uh, companies which have uh, uh, more than 1,000 employees have to implement it next year. And additionally, on, on top, there is negotiated now a European uh, uh, due diligence law, supply chain due diligence law, and we actually see, will see a law up to now, when one can see that, that it will be much much tighter, uh, will address much more companies, and yeah, it will lead to uh, huge uh, bureaucracy. So, in, uh, with regard to the objectives we have, yeah, we are on the same side. But when it comes to the question of implementation, we have huge differences, and uh, especially when, it, uh, when we have now, a, when we are facing a situation, a, a new situation after, not only after, um, um, after the COVID uh, pandemic, yeah, but especially after the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And uh, we are in a new world, the Chancellor has said it, and we have to question ourselves if in this new world we, uh, we are right with a law which does not 
correctly address strategic and geostrategic questions, I think. And then so far, we have to think about it. And we have to think what we can do on the European level. Mm -hmm. And we come back to the European level in a second, um, and also to the transatlantic level. But I also wanted to bring um, you into the discussion because, I mean, UPS makes supply chains work, so to say. I mean, <laughs> you, you are a company which transports lots of things around the world all the time, every day, every minute, minute every second. Um, so um, what if such an initiative um, or such a law, what does this mean for your company? I think, well, as you mentioned, we are positioned, we have a kind of a first-hand view because we move uh, millions of goods every day across the two sides of the Atlantic, so we have a preferential view on uh, a lot of those issues and the impact of a lot of regulations. And what we see is that uh, we see both in the EU and the US emerging regulations and policies that aim, of course, at measuring and uh, accounting for private sector emissions. Um, and I think it's important to know that all these initiatives, which are extremely important, of course, they have an impact on global supply chains. We, we see that. And so I think it, we should not undermine the fact that there is a sort of um, extraterritorial standard setting implications in these initiatives being, um, being developed. And from what we, what we see, because we, again, we move goods all over the globe, and so basically what we think is really important is that uh, the fragmentation and uh, lack of predictability, certainty for companies can be an issue. So potentially, um, the idea of having uh, environmental reporting that is as streamlined, as simple as possible, and have some sort of coordination across the two sides of the Atlantic, I think that in the long run will be extremely important. And also if we look at SMBs, we, we move uh, globally a lot of volumes that uh, SMEs, SMEs that want to, SMBs, small businesses that want to export globally, of course, they rely on our services, and they don't have the capacity sometimes to meet the requirement or to meet uh, or to be able to understand also the requirement of environmental reporting in some case. So I think it's important to understand the impact of climate legislation on small businesses to, to support the small businesses and again to, to agree on coordinated mechanisms. Um, and I think the TTC as we discussed it during this conference can really play a role in this sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and uh, on the TTC I want to bring in um, Tony again, is this um, when the partners meet um, and they have their discussions and there's um, also a work stream um, on supply chains, um, does, um, do, do climate issues, human rights issues, um, labor rights issues, do they play a role in this? Yeah, so <clears throat> first let me say that uh, I'm one of the, the co-chairs for the uh, working group in the TTC on uh, supply chains. And I, over the last uh, year and a half, had a number of conversations, obviously, with the, 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 the EU, talking about all, all of these uh, issues. And so the way the, uh, the TTC is set up is that we have working groups you know, focused on supply chains, but also environmental issues, also on trade uh, and labor cuts across all of those issues. This administration is, is very focused on labor issues because American workers have been devastated by unfair labor practices. And so uh, it, it falls within all of that. There's an overlap within the, within the, the TTC. And I would say that uh, you know, it's, it's critically important to us to work with the EU and all of the member states. Uh, but I would also note that we're also working uh, through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework on these same issues about uh, environmental standards, labor, uh, and supply chains. And we've just announced recently the America's Partnership which is a number of countries in the Western Hemisphere, same issues. Uh, my team works on all of these cross-cutting issues, and so whatever we're doing with the, the EU, we're going to be doing with the Indo-Pacific and also in the Western Hemisphere. So yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. And um, a new work stream or committee has been created on labor issues as well? Yes, that's right. It's, it's part of the working group uh, that's focused on, on trade, so it's between uh, USTR and, and uh, uh, DG Trade, mm -hmm. uh, but it's focused particularly on labor. And um, has something come out of it yet? So it was announced in, in December. So, uh, <laughs> so we had our first, uh, actually, I, I participated. So uh, the US hosted uh, in College Park, Maryland, 
uh, the, the last TTC. And so I participated in that labor dialogue where we had members of the different uh, unions and other stakeholders from both, both sides of the Atlantic who were there to talk about their issues, what was important to them. And we had the senior leaders from both sides of the, of the Atlantic there to hear them. And now the next steps is, as you know, Sweden is hosting the next TTC is to move forward on that. Hmm. I have to admit, I did not know that. Um, which city? Uh, I'm not sure exactly if Sweden has decided, but as okay. you know, they are the, the, the presidency of the EU. No, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, trade agreements now with you. Um, for um, for well-functioning um, supply chains, we need some kind of rule-based order. Um, that could be multilateral. Um, it could be plurilateral. It could be bilateral. Unilateral is probably a little tricky, um, but we need, a, we need rules for this. Um, and in the past, both the EU um, as well as the United States um, has signed quite a few trade agreements. We're still trying to do so as, as the EU. And I want to ask you, what makes a good modern trade agreement, which take into consideration everything um, what you um, have uh, said and tabled? And uh, Marie-Christine, can I start with you again? You can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I found one thought of Michael Link last night during dinner very, very striking, and that was the reflection on what happened when, or what, what happened before and while the US were establishing IRA, mm -hmm. and what happened then on the European side. Um, he said that um, his impression was that. Um, the Americans very much so perceive us as very strong and very good partners. Um, and they didn't even think about um, how, um, yeah, how, how uh, not so good um, Europeans would, might perceive IIA. Um, they were just simply, that's what we basically said, right? Um, that uh, that the, the impact or the, the yeah, the, 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 the dimension of the impact of IIA and, um, on the side of the Europeans wasn't foreseen. Um, and just like that, on the European side, it wasn't foreseen that we wouldn't um, come up with, hey, let's see what, what we make out of that and how we, um, how we deal with it in a positive and productive way. Instead of there was a huge discussion coming up in terms of ours, well, more or less in the direction of retaliation which makes completely no sense at all. And from, from our company perspective, not at all. Um, and for many other people, neither. Um, because obviously, um, in this world, and Stefan has been referring to it already, um, in this very, very, very dynamic and very uh, geopolitically um, challenging world, it would make most sense to tier in one, uh, in one uh, yeah, with one role, on one role. Uh, from a company perspective, coming from a company where we do have very strong European sides and a very strong commitment to our European sides, and at the same time a huge investment in Georgia. Um, so really looking on both sides of the Atlantic and seeing what potentials lie on both sides of the Atlantic and also, again, supply chains. Make supply chains in a way where, they, where they're designed uh, in a good way. It makes sense to cooperate. <coughs> So uh, what would make a good trade agreement, I think, is find a consensus up front and then uh, really see, really put a strong focus on these, um, coming to your first question again, find priorities and set priorities, uh, co jointly agreed priorities, um, for instance, saying uh, we want um, to establish a flow of materials, a flow of, um, uh, of substances we need on both sides of the Atlantic in a way that it ma makes most sense. So and coming up with that up front, that would make most sense to me. Mm. So develop a strategy, common interests. Um, mm. yeah. um, Stefan, what may, what, what, if you were to write um, the next uh, trade agreement, um, <laughs> those 100... <laughs> 1,400 pages as they are usually <laughs> long. What, what would be in there? <laughs> so, you, I, I want to come back to, to the former question, actually, because you asked, what is a modern trade agreement? And a good one. And a good one. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think we are in a time where, as, as Marie-Christine just said, we need priorities. We have to prioritize, 
prioritize um, the, the topics in trade agreements. We cannot put everything in okay. trade agreements. Trade agreements are, um, have the objective to foster trade, to enhance economic relations. And that, is, that should be the objective in trade agreements. And what does that in the end mean? For me, a modern trade agreement in our times is a trade, is a trade agreement we can ratify quickly. And we have to ratify much faster now trade agreements than we did before. And to, address, to also address the environmental issues. Um, I, look, I look to Mercosur uh, and the EU-Mercosur trade agreement. If we do not ratify this agreement, Europe will have no say in how the region will address in the future environmental issues. Within the um, sustainable developed chapter of this trade agreement, there, of course, it is uh, the, the aspects which have been addressed in this are not aspects which, are, uh, which can be um, uh, sanctioned by the European Union. But it is a contract which is a basis for, uh, for enhancing, for fostering economic relations, but also other aspects. And to make it more clear, from my point of view, we, what we have to do is to actually have as soon as possible, as quick as possible, new trade agreements with our partners, with our friends. But this is not the only answer. From my point of view, we should also uh, look at those stages which are in the middle. Yeah, which are in the middle. What do I mean by in the middle? We, have, we are in a new world, as I said. We have on the one side the Western um, uh, open market economies, democracies, and we do see on the other side more authoritarian stage with, um, with um, uh, state um, economies. And if we do not care for those countries which are in the middle, we will lose them. We will lose them to the other side. We will lose influence in, in those regions. And we, ha we do see that already. And that's why I say, let's do it with our friends. But don't forget those partners which we also need to create a better world. Yes, you are allowed to clap. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Andreas, um, at some points in Stefan's, um, uh, uh, little in uh, Stefan's speech, you were nodding, and some parts you were politely listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always polite. So, um, we have been colleagues. I, <laughs> um, lots of the things you said are right. So let's start uh, by, saying, by saying this. And um, uh, I start with one point in talking about the question of being pragmatic. I think that is very important in talking about uh, trading with uh, the United States, for example. This means to stop talking about the idea of having TTIP 2.0 or something. It's not going to happen. It's just like you, you have to talk to, to the members of Congress once and then you know that it's not going to happen. And so the, the thing that we have to do is to start looking at what we can do now. And I, for example, um, think that um, a very precise agreement on the question whether we can lower tariffs um, for industrial goods concerning climate change, new technology, all of this. This could be an idea to move forward, to start at a certain point and then do the next step, do the next step. I would be very interested in your opinion on, on, these, on these questions. Second point, you... Um, um, mentioned Mercosur. Talking to the administration in Brazil, for example, means to know that they have a huge interest in not only trading, but in also safeguarding the rainforest, because they know that this is the, con the only way to, in the end, come to the point where we can save the climate and we can save this planet. It's a little bit big at the moment sitting here, but that's the thing we're talking about. And if we are doing a trade agreement, not having that in mind, then in the end we'll lose much more that we can win on the other side. And the good thing is that there is an administration that wants to work with Europe on these things. The question is much more. Are we willing to give our part 
it could cost something in the end. We'll see. It's not that we, we are just saying, so you are saving this forest for us and we are trading and having the benefits on our side. It's a question whether we are sharing the responsibility for that. And coming to that point means, in the end, having better trade agreements in the end. For example, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have to go this way exactly, but we have a very good trade agreement with New Zealand at the moment because we have sustainable uh, standards or sustainability standards in this agreement um, and it is working and the European Union started to go this way having um, sustainable uh, standards in each and every trade agreement in the future and what the German government is doing and that's what we were negotiating uh, in the new trade agenda of the of the coalition is going this direction together with the European uh, Commission, together with the European Union, together with the partners with New Zealand and now let's see how we get into that direction talking about Mercosur. So we have to get new agreements but it, it is important to have some standards in these agreements because in the end it will be better for our partners and it will be better for us and it will enhance the level uh, of having sustainability. And we started with, the, with the, the question, what are sustainable supply chains? And we said it's about security, but it's also about environment, it's also about social issues. And neglecting this now when it gets more precise mm -hmm. is not a way we can talk about trade and then act in trade policy. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I want to pick up on the issue of um, uh, lowering tariffs for environmental goods because this is also something you mm. mentioned. And this is something which already had been negotiated in the past, right? I mean, there was the attempts to create a plurilateral agreement um, on environmental goods. Um, I don't know if you remember, um, we called it EGA, um, Environmental Goods Agreement. Um, and, um, well, I mean, it kind of died. Um, uh, there were some attempts to... to uh, we vitalize it, but not with great success. Um, if I remember, UPS was um, pretty much in favor of um, uh, such an agreement. Um, uh, why would you explain? Well, I think there is, uh, first of all, I think there is, we, we live, and we were discussing now cooperation, bilateral trade agreements, and these new platforms emerging like TTC. Now we also have a TTC between the EU and India. It's not only EU and US, so new platform to cooperate. And uh, as the Commission pointed out yesterday, to have a comprehensive discussion on how we can cooperate. And I think what is important to keep in mind is that in a scenario in which, of course, the way uh, multilateral governance is changing, we need to find new ways to develop opportunities for business also. Because opportunities for businesses of all sizes, including the smallest businesses. And again, facilitating trade for environmental goods, for clean tech, not only, of course, lower uh, greenhouse emissions and has a positive environmental impact, or at least doesn't have a negative environmental impact, but can really create new opportunities. And I think it's, this is actually what we are going to see in the future. The world is very fragmented in a way. Cooperation takes different shapes and forms, but how can we still create opportunities? And that is why, for example, I think this is an important point. Just to go back maybe quickly on what is an ideal uh, or modern <coughs> free trade agreement, I think it's a free trade agreement that is also focused on environmental sustainability and is also focused on inclusivity. I think the EU-Chile free trade agreement is actually another very interesting example of a trade agreement that for the first time introduced a chapter on gender diversity in trade. So this is also another aspect that where we can, for example, support women-led businesses to export more globally. And this is another way to create opportunities and maybe other free trade agreements should also look at this aspect in terms of like being a more modern, more inclusive version of an agreement. Yeah, thank you so much. Tony? Yeah, I think one word that's important to add is achievable. So yeah. I think that, uh, you know, you, you, you've been around for a long enough time to know the, the different ups and downs in the US-EU uh, trade relationship and uh, are you saying that I'm old? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Experience. 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 Oh, I like that. An expert. Yes. An expert in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, so I, th I think we also have to look at what's achievable. And and from from my perspective, you know, the TTC provides us that 
that opportunity to talk about all these issues and to focus on what's achievable because you know I, I think for the industry, they just don't want another place where people talk about things and nothing actually gets done. And so we're very focused on trying to, uh, uh, Rupert yesterday was talking about these, this, this push for deliverables. Uh, that's something that we're, we're very focused on because we, we know that the industry expects that, needs that. Our citizens expect that and need that too. Yeah, thank you so much. Before I bring in all of you, um, I want to get to one word in our title, which we haven't talked about yet. I mean, no, not the trade and tech conference title, <laughs> but the title of our panel, and that is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And um, we thought that infrastructure is really important also for supply chains. Um, for development, for trade, um, and we hear about all those uh, global infrastructure initiatives. The EU has an infrastructure initiative, the US has an infrastructure initiative, China has an infrastructure initiative, um, and um, do we talk too, too little about infrastructure? Or maybe we talk too much about infrastructure and do too little about it? You are nodding? Yes. <laughs> so. <clears throat> let's let's uh, look at the European level, the Global Gateway Initiative. I'm a bit wondering, it was announced uh, more than one year ago now, I think. So, and we haven't seen very much in the last couple of months, very much, which is getting concrete. There was um, uh, an amount of more than 300 billion euro announced. Mm -hmm. Um, for infrastructure projects, but yeah, now in the last couple of uh, in the last two weeks, I think there was first, firstly, and they are firstly announced first projects, but it's much too slow. When I look at the uh, China uh, Belt and Road Initiative, we have seen now for for um, a long, long time investments on the African continent, which mm. are very. Um, yeah, uh, which are very broad, which are huge, and um, yeah, we, we are coming a bit late, and we have had already a strategy, the connectivity strategy, and we haven't seen uh, much with that as well. So, Europe, if Europe really wants to bring forward sustainability, to, uh, to bring forward environmental issues, we really have to focus on that aspect as well. I do not want to deny that environmental and social issues have to be also addressed in trade agreements, but um, uh, we have to set priorities. When it comes to infrastructure, we can do, but we mm. actually have to go into the countries. Mm. Tony, is infrastructure something which is talked about in the TTC? Uh, not in the TTC, but I would say that this, our administration is very focused on U.S. infrastructure. We've talked a lot about the IRA. Well, that's about the U.S. infrastructure. Uh, the CHIPS Act, uh, that's $52 billion focused on, on U.S. infrastructure. Uh, and so you know, the, the administration wants to focus on first in, investing in the United States to figure out how we can better s support uh, sustainability and, and working with our, our partners. And so, you know, as part of that CHIPS Act, uh, we, we definitely believe in partnerships as being critical on the semiconductor supply chain um, se sector. And so we want to work closely through the TTC and with our other partners on how we then invest in them and other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Marie-Christine, infrastructure matters to you as well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. big times. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> so we actually need everything. We need um, maybe exact planes. I was just uh, wondering. So, but we need ports. Are your products too heavy? Sorry. <laughs> Are your products too heavy for planes? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we need po ports. We need uh, railroads. We need uh, roads and trucks. Uh, we need everything. And um, obviously, we're trying to improve our own um, our own um, infrastructures um, all the time to make them also as. Uh, CO2 neutral as possible, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, we are dependent on that and we see, and obviously our decision to go to Georgia in that specific location um, had a, a, a huge portion of, um, of making the t t um, decision to go exactly there where mm -hmm. we're going was because the infrastructure is perfect, not too close, not too far to Savannah Port, um, uh, good uh, railroad system, um, good, um, good connectivity by, uh, for trucks. 
That is certainly true. And that is also an issue, as many, many other issues we see uh, on the European continent and uh, on the, uh, on the contra uh, contrary, um, um, at least in Germany and Belgium, um, the streets are not in good shape. The railroads are way too, too little and the cap cap uh, capacity is too small. Um, and improve making improvements here is a long, long, long way to go, and it ends up with long um, decision-making processes. Um, whereas, again, in the US, uh, when, in that site we were going to, um, the railroad connectivity is only foreseen, but the planning uh, process is so fast. And then we gave it another push and said, we really, really need it, and now it's all on track. So it's really, there's a slight difference in mindset. And again, what Stefan was uh, saying, Prioritization. What, from a from a lawmaking and, and, and policy making um, point of view, what is it that I want to achieve? Do I want to have stability and growth and prosperity by a flourishing um, industry? Um, then what do I have to provide it with? And that is certainly a energy at affordable mm -hmm. costs. That is raw material supply, and that is infrastructure mm -hmm. and workforce. There's many things, but those things. But you have to pick up. You, 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 have, you have to choose your, as a, a decision-making body. Mm -hmm. You have to pick the priorities and say, okay, what do, we, do I need to ensure that? Mm -hmm. And Andreas, go. we can't do it all at the same time. <laughs> Actually, that's a huge debate that we are having in the German government at the moment. Are we pri um, prioritizing? Are, are we actually not doing it? This, everybody that lives in Germany knows this debate. We Greens are very much in favor of focusing on energy, focusing on repairing our streets, not building new Autobahnen uh, now. Um, so, but that's a discussion that we are going to, to uh, have in the, in the German government uh, in, the, in, the next coming, in the coming weeks. Um, I want to, to, to um, add something in general to this question of infrastructure because it's of, uh, of high importance uh, and there's many aspects to it. There's the aspect that we just uh, had talking about uh, the energy supply. We need new pipeline projects, for example, in Europe to Spain, coming from Spain, France, Germany, to be able to have um, in future cheap supply of energy, what is crucial for any kind of, of, uh, of industry and economy. So there are huge um, uh, infrastructure projects in Europe that um, we have to, um, to start and then finish as fast as possible. But there's another aspect to it. And maybe uh, um, I come back to what I said in the, in the beginning, not being naive anymore. How naive have we actually been when we sold the harbor of Piraeus to China? Just a, few, just a few years ago. It was being naive towards Russia when it comes to gas. It was so naive when it comes to, uh, to, to selling infrastructure to China in a time when it, where it was just not necessary uh, to do it. It was just the idea of uh, punishing Greece in the end, I would, I would put it this way. And it had no strategic view in a sense of what is coming and uh, what do we need in the in the end, and that means infrastructure. And we had uh, just now the, the the discussion on Costco. It's uh, a harbor in um, uh, in Hamburg or a terminal in the harbor of Hamburg. We were very much in favor to be very strict on not letting China get into this harbor. It was a huge discussion in our government. We didn't get quite there. We had to, to, to compromise in the end. But, um, but uh, in general, like being, having a much more strategic view on CHIPS, the CHIPS Act in the US, we are getting one in the, in, in the um, European Union now, um, having the infra infrastructure, not selling crucial infrastructure to countries uh, um, that we cannot rely on, etc. So there's a lot of aspects to this infrastructure uh, topic, and it's of huge importance. Mm -hmm. And with this, I would love to open it up for the audience for questions. Um, <clears throat> so please, um, yes, please. Ah, Claudia, <laughs> if I see correctly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Claudia Schmucker from the German Council on Foreign Relations. First, a short comment. I'm really happy that you talk about infrastructure because I think when we talk about allies, um, about French shoring, about how to have partners, it's not only free trade agreements, 
but infrastructure. And my point would be what Stormy mentioned, we have so many initiatives. We have Global Gateway, we have Build Back Better World, we have so many G7 initiatives. Um, where's the point where the US and the EU can push one forward so we believe in it? I mean, we have all these um, all these names, and I, do, I don't think they were filled with, with, um, yeah, with financial um, commitments. I think this is what Stefan mentioned. Mm -hmm. And my second point would be um, free trade agreements. Um, we talked about the necessity that's um, important to get rare earth and raw materials. And we heard Dr. Cookies just before who said we can no longer expect from countries in the global south to just have extraction. So what does this mean? If we want to have more value added, uh, what does this mean for a uh, free trade agreement with Mercosur or other countries? Thank you so much. Anybody else who wants to jump in now? This is your, one of your last chances, I have to say, because our conference is also coming almost to a close. No? Well, the, uh, thank you. <laughs> Cookies in the previous Could session. you please stand up so that everybody sees yeah. you? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask the question to the uh, um, Mr. G20, um, because uh, nobody mentioned here these two days the issue of digital taxation. So it was a very a, a controversy for many years between Europe and the US, in particular between France and the US. They reached a final or basic agreement in the Rome G20 meeting with BEPS and the two pillar approach. But now we are waiting for implementation. So that means, is this issue off the table? Or so what do you think about uh, the future of digital taxation, also taking into account that a lot of developing countries, Brazil, India, are very interested in the issue. And it's now under the umbrella of the OECD and G20. So uh, what is the future of this issue? Thank you. Mm, so many issues which have an impact on trade and taxes is uh, definitely one of them. Um, let me hand uh, first over to Emmanuel. Um, do, mm -hmm. Would you like to answer to some of Claudia's questions? Well, uh, I, I think when we look at infrastructure, I mean, I probably am I'm, I'm positioned a bit not, not in an ideal place to to comment on infrastructure, but like from the perspective of maybe, maybe I can add another element to the discussion. For the perspective of a transportation company, I think we also need to look at the importance of the transport infrastructure. Um, and I think the transport infrastructure, because goods move thanks to transport means, and in the end we have a significant potential in terms of cooperation between the EU and the US to actually sustain also uh, the green transition of the road and the air transport. I think one of the very first tangible outcomes of the TTC was actually this agreement on common technology standard for uh, heavy duty vehicles charging systems, which was really like one of the first things that was discussed. And now the possibility also for the US to support the transition towards zero emissions by also facilitating the uptake of uh, bridging technologies like uh, bio liquid LNG or bio CNG. I think that's also very important, a very important element that will become crucial in the future. And then there is also a big discussion and maybe from our perspective very important also, what is the future in terms of uh, aviation fuels, transition towards sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, there is still a significant price gap between the sustainable aviation fuel and the conventional jet fuels. And so of course, there might need to be tax incentives and uh, potentially this price will have to be reduced for airlines to be able to purchase these type of fuels. So from our perspective, that's how we look at infrastructure. So maybe in this way, just I can add another element to, to the discussion. Hydro, hydro powered planes for across the Atlantic flights? <laughs> well, that's too, too soon. <laughs> yeah, it's a little too soon maybe. But um, we are also looking into the future. Um, uh, Stefan, would you also come in on Claudia's questions and yeah. maybe also on the tax issue? Um, I will do. Um, first of all, I would like to answer to the raw material uh, question and the question what we have to offer in the future, those countries where we look for raw materials. And what we can offer is technology. We can offer technology to those countries and investments to uh, extract uh, raw materials I think that is something which is very much welcomed by those states. And I really hope that there, um, we were discussing in the German government 
um, the, the, the question of um, uh, a raw material strategy. This is something which, we have, which, which has to be addressed in that strategy, um, first of all. Secondly, um, digital taxation. So I'm not too much involved in, uh, in the, this is something for the government, but um, what, what is definitely necessary is that we do not see taxation which hinders actually um, uh, growth in the field of, um, of, um, of those companies. We do need them in Europe much more. Uh, and we haven't seen too much investment in the tech um, area in Europe in the last couple of years. Um, and so far, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against digital taxation, but we have to very closely look at how we can actually foster investment in the tech, um, in the tech field in, in Europe. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I will stop here. Yeah, Marie, uh, Christine, um, when we talk about, I mean, building up on, on Claudia's question, um, those countries want technology transfer and they want not just to export the raw materials, mm -hmm. but also to refine and then to um, move up the, the mm -hmm. value chain. But that doesn't mean, um, I mean, when we talk about technology transfer, that we um, give our technology for free, right? Or what, what does it mean? No, well, no. obviously not. Obviously I mean, not. <laughs> no, obviously not, but um, again, it's a, it's a matter of partnership here. And um, I know, don't know who, who read it, but um, while um, Chancellor Scholz visited um, uh, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil just two weeks ago or two or three weeks ago, um, Aruba signed an um, agreement, a memorandum of, memorandum of understanding with um, Codelco, the biggest um, copper um, corporation um, in the world in Chile, um, expressing exactly that, supporting them in becoming more environmental friendly with, techni uh, with techniques, um, uh, while as strengthening our business partnership. And this is what I wanted to point to. Um, what does it take, or what, do, uh, what, what does it mean for this, uh, for, uh, particularly for those companies in, the, in Southern America? Um, I, I would like to make very clear we are all, the entire world is heavily depending on the mining sector of Southern America. The demand for copper and many other metals, but most, mostly copper, is so huge and steady, steadily increasing still because all transformation technologies, all renewable energies, all grid improvements, all electric vehicles, uh, consume vast amounts of copper and other metals. But let's, let's have a look at copper because it's so beautiful <laughs> and so important. Um, so um, there is no point in time on the horizon where we will be independent from mining. Um, and that is while having a complete focus, as in Arubis, uh, to increase recycling capacities as much as we can. Um, so coming back, we're very, very dependent, dependent on a very intensive expansion and intensification of the mining sectors in Southern America. And obviously, uh, while doing so, we must enforce and encourage them and support them in implementing the most sustainable um, mining techniques we can have. And there is really strikingly um, impressive um, um, techniques and, and, and method, uh, methods to do so. And I think this is something where, where the Chile, uh, where the Southern Americas, Chile, but other countries as well, um, with those partnerships with European companies can really, really benefit from. And again, we are dependent on their on their steady flow. But we, from our experiences with dealing with them, it is really they perceive us as partners. And one word on China, just to touch it very briefly, from our experience, they are very longing to make business with us. They know that the sustainability track is so much better if they cooperate with us instead of with Chinese companies. They completely convinced, so they do want to. But um, the Chinese, with coming with all those monies and with very, very, very short uh, procedures of permitting and, <laughs> and granting money, it's sometimes a little tricky. Yeah, could I mention that? So we have a 
uh, maybe the audience isn't aware, we have a mineral securities partnership that Germany is actually a part of. This is a new initiative focused on sustainable mining and extraction of critical minerals. And so it's a mixture of developed and, and developing countries. But for example, Canada is a place that is very rich in critical minerals. Mm -hmm. But as, as you mentioned, China, China has cornered the market on both the mines and also the processing. Uh, they don't do it sustainably, and they can pay the lowest, uh, the highest price, and sell at the lowest price. And so uh, we have united uh, uh, Germany, included with Canada, the United States, and others, because we, we recognize that uh, on critical minerals, it, it must be sustainable. It must be fair wages for mm -hmm. the workers. It must be environmentally friendly, and it has to bring a value added to the to the place that you're you're you're, you're pulling these these minerals out. Uh, but we have to compete with China who d does all the opposite of that. And so when we're talking about infrastructure and trying to support that infrastructure, this mineral security partnership is the answer to that, but it's new and it's difficult to compete with China. We are at a very interesting point now because putting the things that Stefan Runhoff and you just said together, um, starting at the point that many, many countries middle-sized countries, but also big countries like Brazil, um, South Africa, very m many countries. They are just asking themselves the question, with whom are we actually going to work? Are we uh, open for everybody? Are you going with Europe, the US? Are we going with China? Are we going with, uh, with Russia in the end? That's um, a, a, a huge strategic question that will be answered in the coming years. And um, uh, seeing this, we have to ask ourselves the question, what can we offer in the end? What is the, the, the main thing that we have to go there and say, work with us, it's better for you? And that's the point where the strategic question and the sustainable question come together in the end. So if we can tell these countries, if you are working with us, you will have sustainable development in your country. You won't have extraction and then we are taking uh, um, the, the goods and uh, you will stay where you are. There will be no development as China is doing this. As soon as countries understand this, they will know why, why it is important to work with us. So having trade agreements, having, having um, uh, investments, uh, raw material policy, whatever, um, that puts first the idea of sustainability, of working uh, on the same level with these countries, will firstly bring social standards, secondly bring environmental social standards, and thirdly will bring security in the end and strategic advantages in, in, the, in, the, in the global global foreign policy. And thinking this together opens up a way to go for us, Europe, the US, in the next 10, 15 years, doing the stuff that we have done in the last years will bring us in a dead end in the end. Yeah, may, may I answer the question oh, on yeah. di digital taxation? So I, I spent a lot of time for the last three years working on this issue. And so uh, we were at a very difficult situation with our, our European partners on digital tax. Uh, reaching an agreement at the OECD on a global minimum tax is a really big deal, was a, a big deal. And particularly in the United States, uh, putting a new tax was not a very popular move by the, the current administration, but they were able to, to, to agree to that. And so we still continue with those. Well, we're hoping to, to finally have everything completed at the OECD. But that, that's a, a huge number of, of uh, not only at the OECD, but a, a huge number of other countries that have bought into the global minimum tax. And so that's, that's a big deal. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I, I, I uh, keep getting uh, the eye from my team. I could go on forever and they know this. So <laughs> um, this unfortunately concludes um, this really interesting um, panel, but I very much hope that we continue um, this discussion. Um, I, um, there's so many other aspects we, we could have touched um, upon today and even digged a little deeper. Um, I find it so interesting to watch what is currently happening on the, in the Bundestag um, on, on, on trade issues, on the European level, on the transatlantic yeah. international. So much is happening every day. Um, this just marked um, for us a start um, of this uh, dialogue. We very much hope um, to continue it. Give them a huge applause. Um, they, yeah, please. <laughs>